Hello, Nyambe. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Sorry, I had technical challenges with network. No problem. No problem. Um, we have uh, we have a small group today, but uh, nonetheless a powerful group. So um, uh, I think uh, I've given everyone just a little bit of uh, some of the housekeeping issues, but I'll just repeat one more time, uh, and then we will turn it over to you, uh, followed by another uh, another demo after. So uh, a couple things. One is. Um, uh, I'm going to have everyone on mute uh, just to allow the presentation um, from Nyambe to, uh, to proceed. Um, there's two ways that you can ask questions and engage. One is on the bottom of your uh, Zoom link, there is a little icon that says reactions and you can click reactions and raise your hand, just like I've done um, right here. If you press the reaction button again, uh, you can lower your hand so you can see that my hand uh, just went away. So that's one way if you uh, don't want to use the chat. Secondarily, uh, we do have the chat uh, here listed. Um, chat, chat, chat. As you can see, I've just typed in. Um, and that is to everyone in the meeting. Feel free to post your question in there. If you, you know, you, maybe you have some audio challenges or you just want to uh, pose the question to the group. I would be happy to read that question out and um, we can create some dialogue. I encourage everyone to uh, participate, ask questions, um, there's a few of us, so we can make it really, really intimate and really fun. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zambia Red Cross. Nyambe, the floor is yours, and I'm going to make you co-host right now. Congratulations. Uh, and you'll be, able to, uh, you'll be able to share your screen. So over to you. Thank you, George, and greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Movita Nyambi from Zambia Red Cross in Africa, and currently I'm working in Kalawo district, which is 900 kilometers away from Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. Um, so while working in Kalawo district under the Emergency Appeal Project funded by the IFRC, I came up with a, a mobile application um, to help volunteers. So the idea of the mobile application is basically to build the capacity of the volunteers as well as members of staff um, on various issues. So while we're implementing the emergency appeal project, um, there was an advent of COVID-19. So we had restrictions in terms of movement and as well as uh, trainings, we could not meet. Um, and so I came up with uh, this mobile application uh, that is open source and can be replicated for any national society uh, and can be used by others. So it is simple. As long as you have uh, mobile data, you can access it. And you can use it. And as long as you also have a... We may be losing you a little bit on the audio. Okay, I, am I clear now? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so uh, I was just explaining that uh, I'm now trying to share my screen. I'm sharing my screen now so that everyone can see and visualize what I'm talking about. Um, we are loading, okay. very good. Yes, okay. Is everyone seeing my screen? Uh, no, not yet. It almost did. Um, it looked like it was about to, but uh, um, you might need to do that again. OK. We usually have challenges here because we are very far from the, from the capital city where, the, where there are better networks. So there are challenges in terms of accessing uh, internet facilities here. So please bear with me, but I hope you'll be able to, to see it now as I share. It looks like it's coming now. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is the Zambia Red Cross Disaster Management app. Um, as already explained, the primary objective is to share information and to build the capacity of volunteers as well as staff members. 
Um, so it has a platform um, that explains issues to do with uh, disaster preparedness as well as disaster response. So it has two components of disaster response and as well as disaster preparedness. So in terms of preparedness, um, so far what has been built, it is still being built. Um, so far what has been built is a national disaster response platform um, where we have information on assessment forms and reporting tools. Um, these templates are in web format. So suffice to mention that this, this mobile application can host uh, any type of, um, any type of uh, format. It can host uh, .cx, the PDF formats, as well as PowerPoint. So these are in web format. Then the, the slides are in PowerPoint. Then it can as well host videos. I will not play videos for now because we may have some hissing sound. I should have shared this with George. Uh, I had challenges with internet. So it has videos that have been hosted um, explaining what uh, needs assessments are, what Red Cross is, how IFRC operates and whatnot. Um, sometimes we have challenges with our volunteers uh, failing to, to utilize applications like Zoom. So it also has basics on how to use Zoom and, and whatnot. So basically some pictures there. Uh, one interesting part is the, the, the membership form or the, the membership form for the National Disaster Response team members. So once you click there on the on the membership form, it redirects you to um, to this page where you can enter your information. And once you enter your information, so it will load like that. So this is the information. It has biographical information as well as uh, trainings. Uh, availability for deployment, sections to do with the location of the volunteer or the National Disaster Response Team member. So then um, once someone enters information there, it will also show the map where they are. It will basically pick the information and take it into a database, a database that is hosted elsewhere. So it will show the information of the volunteer or the volunteers, as well as members of staff. So we can create dashboards showing how many males we have, how many females we have, which province or which district. It can also as well show charts. Um, it can populate photos as well as uh, a map uh, showing where uh, the volunteers are. It can simply show the distribution of the volunteers as per area or per district or province. So this is basically a map, a map of Zambia that shows where the volunteers are. At a click, if you click, if you click there, uh, on that button, it will show the volunteer, their names, their, all their details and where they are found. So basically, that is how it operates at that point. It also has useful links, um, useful links to IFRC learning portal, the Glofas, the Go platform, uh, weather forecasts. The most interesting part for now is the COVID-19 live statistics. So once you click there, it redirects you to um, a live statistics platform that shows the number of cases, the current statistics. So in terms of Zambia, these are the total cases that have been recorded. So it has been synchronized with the, with the systems and servers of the country um, that are capturing information to do with COVID-19. So those are the cases, the deaths. Uh, so it is showing the actual statistics, the active and the closed cases as, as of today and as of now. Um, the Glofas can also pop and also show the information. Okay, so it is capturing information from Glofas systems. Um, okay. Can capture information from the Go platform, showing uh, what is happening across the globe, what IFRC is doing in terms of emergency appeals and uh, drafts. It can show what is being done by IFRC. Okay, so basically on the useful links, this is what it can show. It can show maps. Uh, these are basic databases and dashboards that have been built. So the weather forecast for Zambia, it can as well open. So basically at a click it will open. 
So in terms of preparedness, that is what uh, is there. We are still building issues to do with uh, focus-based financing, as well as disaster risk reduction. We are also building components on uh, livelihoods, uh, wash and shelter. But for now, we have uh, information already that is there on cash voucher assistance. Um, the project that we've been doing in Calabo, uh, the emergency appeal had a component of cash, cash voucher assistance. And so we thought it was a good platform to, to embed information to do with uh, cash learning uh, so that we can build the capacity of the volunteers and uh, members of staff because we could not meet with them physically. So we shared through this mobile application. So they could uh, simply download the app on their phones and they could see this information. Okay. Okay, so this is information, these are videos. Okay, uh, the last part uh, for the useful links, we have a cash and emergencies toolkit. If you, if you click it, it will open. Um, so this encourages volunteers and staff to, to learn more and it just gives them that prompt to open information bases or databases. Okay, uh, I'll open the last one. I'll open the last useful link. Okay, which is the IFRC learning portal. So basically a volunteer can just enter their details there or a, members of, a member of staff can enter their details there. And once they enter the details, they can, they can see all the courses and register for any course there. And then they can, they can learn through. Okay, so this just encourages them to learn. Uh, so it just combines all the information in, in, a, in, a, in a one one app that can be used. Instead of having to check on the internet, it just synchronizes everything and combines everything, brings together all the tools that are necessary for them to have information to respond to the communities that I need. Perhaps I could stop sharing at this point. Okay. I am going to, uh, if you could just bring it back to me. Okay, that's good. Um, come off you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Everyone can hear me okay? Yes? Great. Um, I'm looking into the chat right now. I don't see any specific questions, but I did want to open it up to. Uh, to the intimate group here, uh, if there's any questions uh, that we wanted to uh, we wanted to ask, uh, perhaps about the app, maybe difficulties uh, around it, uh, logistics, setup, operating systems, anything. I'll I'll turn it over to the floor now uh, to see if anyone has any any questions for our for our guest. You can use the chat. <clears throat> if uh, you don't feel like coming off a video or you can raise your hand. Sarah, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mubita, for this uh, presentation. Very informative. Um, so actually, I have a question about um, the design of the, of the app itself. So um, if you could tell us more about like the thinking process you had, like did you engage with um, volunteers from the Red Cross in Zambia to try to ideate for this for this app. Like, what was the the inspiration behind it? Like, was it based on the needs that you've identified? Was it something that you did um, in a participatory manner, or is it something that you thought was a need and you just kind of developed the app accordingly? Okay, uh, George, guidance. Uh, are we responding to questions as they come or we we pile one or two? I, yeah, I think uh, it's a small group, so we can, uh, yeah, go ahead and, and answer Sarah's question. It'll be first come, first serve, and I'll facilitate and moderate if, if there are more people. Okay, so thank you for the question. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so it has, uh, it was built as a result of two things. Firstly, there was need. 
because we could not meet uh, physically because there were government regulations and restrictions as a result of COVID. So there was need uh, to train volunteers and staff. There was need to find a way. There was need to find an alternative of training others. Um, but then overall, it came as a result of the passion. The passion um, I'm sure by now um, it has been mentioned that I'm not even IT. So uh, I come from an environmental background. So I just did it out of the interest and the innovation, just try and see how I can help uh, in that situation. I, I hope I've answered the question. Yes, yes, you did. Thank you. Other questions anyone? Uh, anyone may have. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Hi, everybody. I'm Heather. I'm with uh, Soferito as well. But Diva, I think it's really great that you're working on innovation. Now, this tension between them, um, I find that innovation happens in every department and is part of everyone's responsibility. Would you say that your IT department is supportive of you doing these kinds of work? Or how, 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 how has your experience been? Because I think it's really good to have ideas. It's just a matter of like, can you scale them, right? How's that going? in Zambia. You're in Zambia, right? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I can confirm that our IT department has been very supportive. Um, so they love the idea. Uh, of course, it came from more or less, I could say, a community, a local level, uh, since we are operating from that local level. So they were so happy that even from the local level, uh, big things can come from there. So they adopted it and shared it among us, the volunteers across the country. No wonder we are calling it the National Disaster Response Team. So it's for the nation and not only for the community where we are operating. So it started from our community, but now we have shared it with everyone. So our IT department is very active and helping us here and there. And thank you. We have a question from Mirva as well. Yeah, I wrote it in the chat first. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mubita. But it's kind of a follow up from what Heather was asking, because I was thinking of what kind of challenges did you face? And uh, like she mentioned, sometimes maybe we have these great ideas and then it's hard to get support from your national society or from everybody. So I'm happy to hear that you didn't, didn't have those problems with your IT. Uh, but were there any other kind of challenges when you, when you started to run from this idea to the actual kind of product and any kind of uh, lessons from your from your journey from the idea to the product. Miva, hi, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, so I think in terms of challenges, uh, the biggest challenge that I had was um, issues to do with the network, the internet itself. Operating from a community like this one uh, is not easy and also building tools from a community like this one is not easy. So I had challenges. The biggest challenge was internet uh, because it is hosted online. So I had challenges and sometimes volunteers also had challenges accessing the, you know, the, the mainframe. Uh, so those are the challenges. And so perhaps others would want to know then how do you hope to address the challenges? I, I'm thinking I'm thinking someone who asked that question. So perhaps I could respond already that um, perhaps we need to work together as a team, find a way of uh, building this together, um, as well as hosting it, sub-hosting it on other servers that may run online and offline. I think that could be the way to go. Okay, Mirva, <laughs> she's happy with that response. We also have a question here in the chat from, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, uh, Ellie, am I saying that correctly, Ellie? Um, yes, that's, uh, that's clear, George, and uh, I think uh, he has responded to some of the questions I asked on the chat. Uh, that's a, a quite follow up on the same, uh, and uh, one is in terms of apps. I know when you're developing apps, <laughs> there's some of the, uh, Medication and remedies you have to figure out uh, the moment you want to sync it with the other systems. And uh, being uh, one of the key challenges, I just highlighted in terms of how now we can able to uh, volunteer who are, you know, based on that area they are, there's a probability in terms of internet uh, connect 
activity. And uh, the way now volunteers need to own the process and understand how to use a, a clear system while they're working offline. So I think that's some of the key things that I was trying to highlight because most areas that we're working with are more offline and uh, this system is more based on the apps, more based on the uh, online version. So that's quite a challenge in terms of now uh, allowing the users to log in wherever they're in remote areas, wherever they are collecting that specific data sets in their, con their common localities. So that's one of the key things also I saw it come out and uh, probably as we address going forward, you know, how we can able to work to support uh, Nyambe in terms of now figuring out how we can now pull this system in terms of offline uh, just to more for more users to have reached and also how we can able now sync it with other internal system that's one of also key things so uh, also we, we see how it can able to be used now in the larger scale and also replicate it with the other different national sites i thanks for the good all support that we are providing with Nyambe, making sure that uh, that system gets rolled out and able to support uh, the local communities thank you over George. thank you Thank you, thank you. Uh, that was um, that was that was that was wonderful. Uh, other questions? Um, raise your hand. Uh, please put it in the chat. It's uh, it's actually been uh, it's it's been a great demo so far. I will ask one, and then uh, just give some people a chance to to think of some. And if not, we can move to our next demo. But uh, my last question would be. Uh, now that the now that you're looking at this uh, this this initiative and this project, and you know you had mentioned uh, internet access being a a, a big challenge, um, what if you did have that internet access? What would be what would be something that you would do differently if you started the whole project over and you had all the elements that um, that that were were required to to make the project uh, even better. What would be perhaps one thing you would do differently if you were to start the project over? Thank you, George. Thank you for the <laughs> question. Yeah, I think um, given chance, given all the materials, given internet, given a better computer, because also uh, the quality of the computer also matters. So, given a better framework. Um, for using, I would, I think, reprogram everything. I would build it, I would build it in Python um, such that it can have uh, better qualities and as well as better features that can be offline and online, as well as that can sync the information to other uh, based servers, online based servers. So I think I would just reprogram everything using Python um, of course, not being an expert, I would still continue learning also Python here and there. Okay, great. Uh, last chance for questions, uh, if anyone has any, and if not, um, we can move to our, our, our next demo, which is moving in along nicely. Well, that's okay. If some come up, please put them in the chat. We have a few people monitoring those, uh, those questions. So if something pops up along the way, um, we would be happy to go back. Um, it's a great interactive group. I am going to turn it over now to um, one of my peers, uh, Sarah from Solferino. Sarah um, uh, uh, handles youth innovation um, for us. And she has uh, a few very interesting demos that uh, she wanted to take everyone through. So I will, uh, let's see, make sure I've made you co-host, which I have. I'm going to turn the floor over to Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to have you all here. Um, so what I'm going to be sharing with you is not something um, specifically related to Red Cross, but it's something that I've done um, as part of my PhD in Open Lab at Newcastle University, which is very much in the field of digital civics, which is how do we actually leverage technology to support in different uh, civic issues that could be related to education, to health, to civic engagement. So I thought that the projects that I might show you just could be as an inspiration for anyone who's interested in doing something similar within their national societies. Um, the first project that I'm gonna be showing, I'll show a video about it. Um, this is like, uh, so it's based on an engagement that I was doing with a youth organization in Lebanon called For All Causes. 
and we had a series of design uh, workshops, participatory design workshops, because I have identified them as a small grassroots that is navigating a very challenging context such as Lebanon and that are very interested in health services within that space, particularly um, related to health equity uh, for underprivileged communities, how to make health services more accessible, how to actually support local communities and leverage uh, existing assets that are related to public health. So through a series of workshops that we've done with different kinds of exercises and activities, and I'm happy to share about these after if anyone wants to know more, um, we were able to um, come up with a basic uh, mapping system, which is open source. And it actually, uh, Mubita, it, it reminded me of the, of the thing that you showed us on your app, the mapping, uh, because it's quite similar, but it's definitely less advanced than that. But because the organization is a small one, so they, don't, they also don't have like the resources for a very advanced system. So we already had an open source mapping platform in Open Lab that we adapted for the country, for Lebanon. And um, I will show you now how, how we used it so that it actually uh, responds to the mission of the organization. And so that they are able to uh, enhance their service delivery and promote the model that they're trying to promote. I'm not going to say more just so that I can show you the video and then I'm happy to take questions and explain a bit more about it. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so stop because it shared the wrong screen. Sorry, just a minute. Okay. Um, can you all see my my screen? Just a thumbs up or something to make sure, yeah. It, okay. it looks good, yep. Perfect, so I'm gonna start playing the video. Today, I'm gonna show you how to use the For All Causes community map that was developed between For All Causes and Open Lab at Newcastle University. For All Causes is an organization that's based in Lebanon that is particularly focused on health services delivery for underprivileged communities and changing the health narrative in Lebanon. In order to access the map, you will have to go to the website lebanon.make.place. Once you've opened the website, you will find a map of Lebanon. To know more about the map, you can press on info to read the description about it. In order to participate, you will have to press on login. If you do not have an account, you need to register one. If you do, you can just log in using the credentials that you've created for this account. Once you've logged in, you're going to find two tabs, one for volunteers and one for NGOs. If you are a volunteer, you can press on the volunteer tab. As you can see, there are multiple pins representing volunteers. In order to participate yourself, you have to first determine your location. Once you have your location, you press on add response and pin yourself in that exact location. You will get a survey that you need to fill. The survey will ask you about your educational background, employment status, specific skills, and the time that you have available for volunteering, and any other important information that you would like to convey. And finally, it will ask you to provide with your contact information. Once you submit your survey, you will find yourself as a PIN with all your information displayed. If you are an NGO or a group, you can go to the NGOs needs map. This page is specifically for NGOs to specify their needs. First of all, you will also have to select your location and press add response. Once you've set your location, you can also fill your NGO profile, contact information, specific needs and the communities you work with, and what are the services that you currently offer. Once you press submit, you will also find a pin representing your NGO. The purpose of this map is to match between volunteers and NGOs or community needs. If volunteers are looking for community needs or NGOs to work with, they can go to the NGO needs map. If NGOs or groups are looking for volunteers that they can ask for their services, they can go to the volunteer map and check them by region and by area. This map can be tailored to any country and can be changed depending on the purpose requested. Thank you for watching. So yeah, so this is the 
this is the map. It's open source, as I mentioned, and it doesn't really require um, very advanced technical skills because the whole purpose was to make it something that um, any, any small scale um, organization that doesn't have a lot of resources can potentially use. And what was really worth mentioning is that we also had to rely on WhatsApp to make this map even more um, usable or effective because a lot of the time people would not necessarily pin themselves, especially for the NGO community needs because of like digital literacy issues or because the general culture is not necessarily about opening like a website and just pinning yourself. But they would look at the map and then they would contact the organization through WhatsApp to, to say that, oh, we saw that you have volunteers in that area and these are our needs. Can you please um, contact them to, so, so they can come and support us? And vice versa, like certain volunteers would ask us to see if we have any NGOs or communities that have uh, any specific needs that they can respond to. So it was particularly um, used during COVID because there was an increase in, in uh, social needs due to the economic like crisis that's currently in the country, but it was also used after the Beirut port explosion as well, because there were a lot of needs um, that, uh, that obviously were, were being uh, were raising uh, because of that arose because of that. So this was a quick response as well uh, to know where are the areas of intervention. So if anyone has any question, I'm happy to answer. Just a reminder, we have, uh, you can raise your hand or we can put it into the chat. Any questions from the group? I have one. So um, being a map nerd, I see the map layer is Google. Is that true? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I would recommend OpenStreetMap um, because Google you're a researcher, right? So you're allowed to use Google, but if it ever becomes something that a nonprofit uses, then they need to have um, the proper license for it. I'm a little bit of a license geek. Yeah. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm here to help connect anybody who would like to use OpenStreetMap. So sorry for the politics, but I have some, okay. but I'm really excited about, um, you know, many years ago, I worked on a project called Ushahidi mm -hmm. and it was all about connecting people to each other, right? and excuse me, giving people a chance to, to say what they need and what they have. How do you manage privacy with that one? So the thing is that, so this is all definitely re related by GDPR, but we do not, uh, so the system does not collect any personal identifiers per se. Um, personally, I don't know a lot about the technical aspect of it because there's a specific developer who, who worked that out. But uh, what I could tell is that um, like we made sure that we cannot necessarily um, collect any, any data that could be um, like, unless you pin your information, there's nothing that the system will collect automatically if you go onto it. Um, but yeah, and I do know this, uh, the open streets and actually it was something that we were considering, but at the time, the person who was going to do it for us uh, could not actually because of like, again, constraints and resources. So we had to go with this one because it's obviously being hosted at open labs, so which made it easy, as you mentioned, to use the Google, Google maps. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. For the Thanks, Sarah. Others, others who may have any questions. Um, okay, I'll ask one um, for you, Sarah. So um, as you reflect on this project and think about some of the, uh, the challenges along the way outside of technology, so there's the technology challenges, which are how are we going to make this whole thing work? What were some non-technology challenges that you think um, either impacted the project um, or uh, maybe that you weren't expecting that you had to, uh, uh, you had to pivot or reconsider in order to, to deliver the vision of the project that you had. Yeah, I mean, thanks George for the question. So the thing is that um, originally this, we didn't really have an idea in what direction we are heading. Like we knew that there was this organization and they wanted to go through this kind of digitalization of their services and to try and see what's the best way to do it, considering that 
they don't have uh, financial resources, they don't have technical resources. But then as, um, as I went in and started working with them, I realized that they also had like organizational issues. So they were not really um, well formed as a group to begin with. So they had to revisit their own internal organization. So we had to start with that before getting to the technology part. So we were able to kind of change the internal structure of the group to make it a bit uh, more um, structured because it was all over the place. You know, with small um, NGOs, uh, nonprofit sector, it's often the case that people are very driven, very motivated, and they don't want to be um, like, they want it to be very democratic and participatory, but often it's not very structured. So we were able to reach a point where they had a more democratic structure, but it was also well established before actually dwelling onto the conversation around technology and how can they, they use technology, we had, to, we had to really navigate a lot of uncertainty, which I, st I think is the case with a lot of countries, um, especially in the developing world, where the circumstances on the ground kept changing, which meant that we weren't always able to, to meet, to discuss ideas, to discuss what's the best fit for them in terms of designing, we had to go through a lot of uh, prototyping, like different um, ideas. And we actually experimented with a lot of off the shelf tools as well, to try to see um, what's the best way to adapt it or tailor it. And that's why I also resorted a lot to social media platforms and WhatsApp as a way to support them, because that was the first go to and it's a very cultural also thing that most people want to use WhatsApp when they're running their, their, their organization. And then eventually the same, so I know you ask about general um, challenges. So uh, apart from this whole idea of like uh, starting off with like uh, working on the organization before going more into the delivery aspect of it, we had to navigate a lot of uncertainty on the ground and we tried to kind of establish collaborations between this organization and bigger, more mainstream organization that would have resources to support them to have a more developed uh, tool, for example. But what happened that there was conflicting um, agendas and at some point with all the, the stuff, the political events that were happening in Lebanon, a lot of the partners didn't wanna work together because of that. So that was also another thing. How do you actually get people to collaborate together when they have conflicting agendas and different, different internal politics? And eventually the tool itself had to ch be changed over and over. So it started off, we wanted basically to map out health services in general and just have them on the map like clinics and hospitals. But then as COVID hit, it was more now about volunteers versus community needs because a lot of people took it on their own like uh, responsibility to support people by delivering food boxes, medication, especially when you're going through an economic crisis, it becomes even more challenging. And then up till the explosion where it actually became about immediate relief. So we also had to keep changing as the circumstances were changing. So the tool had multi-purposes, but eventually a lot of the infrastructure for it was on informal networks, uh, offline engagements, a lot of WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp coordination, and things like that. So it's just an idea of how you sometimes need to combine different platforms and, and to really look what the local context is, is using before developing your own, uh, your own tool per se. I hope that answered the question. No, that was that was really great. It's always interesting because you you have a, a plan, uh, a plan of implementation and uh you know depending on who the stakeholders are along the way those plans may change either someone does not agree with the plans that are in place to implement or they have their own idea of what they should be exactly. so it's it's always the magic question of organization sits beside sits behind uh the technology we were in a uh session earlier today with twilio and um the speaker said technology is the the least of our problems. It's the, the technology will do what you want it to do and, and how. Either it, it's sort of a yes or a no, but organization and organ and, and structure. You mentioned structure and teams and organization in a general sense. A lot of negotiations, to be honest, like a lot of <laughs> and the social practices that are around the technology are the things that you really need to, to build as well. 
So how do you get how do you get around that? So you know you know what the right thing is to do, and and you have to negotiate along the way to get by. How do you get the buy-in, or how do you position it in a way to satisfy a whole bunch of different people who want it to do a whole bunch of different things? Reasonable, unreasonable. How do you how do you navigate that? And what's what do you what are your anchors to to make the project stay, you know, as as true as it can be? What do you do? What you're basically asking me about my PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I would I would be happy to hear from people who are with us as well. If, if yes, they, like even Mobita, because I mean, I'm sure when you were designing your app, it wasn't as easy to, maybe to get people to to use it, like volunteers, like or how to to get maybe I don't know. Um, people from the organization to buy into the concept um, because it is it is challenging I think and I don't know if the others had similar things with their like if they were working with digital tools or trying to build systems and getting different people to be engaged in that process um, so I don't know if anyone has also some insights about that that's a that's such a great question that we'll pose to everyone just to 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 sort of codify it a little bit more for Sarah's you know what are the challenges that you've seen to keep something um, something on track and and with its original intent? Um, and how do you navigate uh, those different groups so you can maintain you know the essence of the project? Any any thoughts there from from anyone, Mubita or or Ellie? Anyone, Peter? No. Yeah. You know, I think it's I think it's really important when building any kind of software tool process to really be flexible, like Sarah was talking about, and really understand the situation and be able to shift. And a lot of software, traditional software, so straightforward, straight. This is how it's done, and then then we're done. But whereas most of us are very, very agile. I think one of the biggest concerns I've ever had in terms of working software was getting the buy-in from all the different actors around, as you said, the negotiation, the negotiation, but not just getting the buy-in, but also um, being able to um, scale it, yeah. right? If you have a really good idea, there's so many different pilots across the Red Cross Red Crescent that I've seen. It's getting it up to the next level that I think is for me, the biggest concern I have right now, because I feel like sometimes we're reinventing the wheel. Um, in terms of innovations and stuff. And that's okay because every context is different and it's part of people's learning journey. But at some, at some point we have to think about like, there's only so much money or time that we can spend. And that's why I think open source is really valuable so that we could actually share that across different national societies or different experiences, over. Yeah, Heather, that's actually, um, and I had a thought on Sarah's too, is um, uh, obviously uh, personalities get involved in, in any project. So everyone has a sort of an indication or something in their head that's like, yeah, it's that, but I kind of want it to be this. So they're, they're putting sort of personal, um, personal stock, I guess is the word I'm, I'm hunting for the word. I don't know what it is. Personal um, elements of what they want it to be. But if you focus on sort of, and I think Heather said it like end user or, or who is this for? So it's not for us in this room. Yes, we're building it together, but we're making something yeah. that is for someone who needs this. So it's actually, it's a great way to sort of take the steam out of the room a little yeah. bit when people say, well, I want it to be, and I want it to be. It's like, well, uh, this is all very valid inputs for, from a stakeholder perspective, mm. but will this make sense for the person using it? Or will this make sense yeah. for that person on the ground? And when you can hold to that core element, then mm. suddenly, it, it shifts the conversation a little bit because the conversation yeah. isn't about what George wants or what Heather wants or what Sarah wants. Yeah. It's about who's going to be using this and is it the right thing for that person? So yeah. um, it's a I good think, lever. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I, I do think it's about build with, not for, right? We all need to build with local communities. We all need to work inside these communities and understand each other. And as for um, the personalities, I know I have one too. Uh, we all do. A friend of mine who I really truly adore, he calls when you build software for yourself, it's called egoware. <laughs> it's not software, it is egoware. It's about it, or it's a 
it's going to go to the software graveyard because it's not useful. But anyway, I see that Ellie has a question. I'll pop uh, yeah. <laughs> Ellie, jump in, please. Yeah, but, uh, thanks so much, colleague. <laughs> I see uh, being in the industry for software as, and uh, just one of the things that also we are saying in terms of flexibility. And uh, most users normally, they normally say, what's it for me? And uh, based on building the steam for the first time, uh, one of the key things that uh, I do on my end, <laughs> just using my also my private experience in terms of building software and systems, uh, one of the engagement process at initiation. So we have some of the um, survey feedbacks running, one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting, uh, survey interviews with the team, as we build on, as we move from one step to another. So the label to provide some of the feedback as we proceed. And uh, if you, you can see, as, as we always say, uh, something that you're building for yourself, you can do it very well. So you know all the things that you need to do, you have all the process. But now realize not benefiting the next person and that person is the end user. So that's the key uh, message that I normally say. So making sure that they are they're really engaged in terms of the building stage. Uh, as normally we have, we normally develop something called a rollout plan. So most of the system for software development. So we create a rollout plan, which will have a first session with information session with the team categorized based on the partners who are really engaged in this particular uh, software to use. Now there's national society who are really engaged in this system to use. Engage with them, uh, we normally have either two months information session, just understanding them in aspect of what you need for them, uh, what are some of the things they're able to present, what the work they are doing, because again, you insist on what they are doing so that we don't introduce the system. I say, you know, I have a software, I've already developed a software, not this is what you're going to do now. I, I want to normally engage the users, able to learn from them what exactly they are doing. So that when you realize what you are developing, you are solving their problem. So that's why after the end, you will say, now I see you have this kind of problem. Now I'm presenting you a solution. Now for those of the things that we talked about. So that shows uh, the quite engagement with the user. That's one thing I normally do. And uh, I know it's one of the hectic process whereby each team has its own expectations. So we meet a team in partnership, they have their own expectation. Now they have different expectations, but putting those expectations together through those information session feedbacks, a uh, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, developing some group uh, discussion with the team who are working in the field just to understand what the, what the end users are. That's one of the key things in uh, developing a software and making sure that we have a successful rollout. So thank you so much, Ali Option. Spoken from experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add from, I think, where Eli has left. Um, that yes, flexibility is important as well as engagement of the users. Uh, but in the process of convincing others, I think when you have a new product, it's not an easy road. For me, I think it was not very difficult because there is nothing of this nature in our country for the national society. So it was it was more or less the, 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 the first of its kind. However, I should mention that I, I also had uh, hurdles here and there where uh, like you rightly put it to say personalities. There are some individuals who would say, no, I think it should be this way. So you give them chance to try as well. So we tried it, I, I could mention that we tried it on uh, certain systems like ZAMP. I'm sure people have heard of ZAMP. Yes. Yeah, so we, we, we tried all these systems. So in the process of building anything, for me, apart from engaging users and being flexible, in, in convincing them, we need to try all all the systems that we have available around us. So I think that is what I wanted to mention that we just need to try all the systems that are near near us or at our disposal. If it is ZAMP that you have, you have to try ZAMP, see how it operates, what are the advantages and what are the pros and cons. Thank you, Mubita. And actually a few people said in the chat that they are not familiar with, um, uh, with that with that product, could you tell us a little bit a little bit more about it for some of us who who are not familiar? Oh, you mean ZAMP? Yes, please. Okay, so um, ZAMP is a product that can be used to host uh, servers. Um, I think basic databases on access uh, instead of hosting them online, you can open a frame in your in your home or in your house, just even in your bedroom. Uh, it's a simple system that you just build. Uh, it uses PHP um, and MySQL. Okay. And was there was there a reason why you chose that, or is it um, just you know best on the market? Uh, it, was there any was there any reason why why that and maybe not a competitor? 
Um, I think that is the one that is available. It's easy to use. It's open source. Um, but that one we tried just in, in terms of trying to see the advantages and disadvantages of using it against uh, using an online server. So at the end of it all, we concluded and used an online server. Okay. And uh, thank you, Ellie, for sharing uh, sharing the download. I, I think Abdullah was asking for it. So we've shared that within the chat. If anyone uh, wants to uh, take a look a little bit more into uh, you know how it works and what the benefits are, um, thank you, team, for for posting that for for everybody. Um, we have four minutes left, and uh, this turned into a really spirited conversation with lots of contributions. Um, you know, it, it, we really warmed up um, uh, along the way. So unless there is uh, any other closing thoughts or, or final thoughts, um, I, may, uh, I may say thank you to everyone. Uh, Heather, it looks like you're going to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say really just also to plus one and thanks George for convening this conversation to my colleagues. Um, really glad that you were here. I um, hope that you had a really good data and digital week. Um, and, you know, um, please ask people questions in those sessions too. I've been to some sessions where, which were really quiet. And so I try not to be the quiet person in the room. So I'm hoping that you can find that inner warmth and help us keep the pulse going over and have a good time. Yes, thank you. This was this was really great. Um, two very very interesting projects. I've been keeping notes on the side just for everyone uh, for everyone's information, just around you know challenges and insights because we like to capture these things. Um, we do these things to learn and we do them to share. Um, and there are, I'm sure, even outside of this group, many other people who are looking to do very similar projects and could learn from from some of these learnings. So um, so thank you. Abdullah, you had uh, mentioned, you know, uh, how we connect in a future. Uh, what about a way forward? Yeah, I think that's really great. So we have a data yeah. and digital working group with about 300 people and across different national societies. We also use the Innovation Kitchen mailing list. So I'll drop the mailing list link here. Um, it's the best way to reach everybody, but um, please do um, make some new friends and direct message each other. If, you, if Ellie and Matuba, I, I bet you that you guys have already met each other before, but maybe you haven't met Abdul from, uh, from Pakistan. And so just really glad to move across all these boundaries. I think that's really exciting over. I'll drop the link in. Yes, thank you. A special thank you to Mubita and to Sarah for um, being so brave and, and sharing us that work. It's, it's never easy to do. Uh, it's never easy to go first and it's, uh, it's uh, never easy to go second. So uh, thank you for your bravery um, and really, really, really interesting stuff. It really made the, made the session great. Um, why don't we take everyone, if you're able to, just off of, uh, if you can, yeah, come on video. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, we're, we're here, it's virtual. We would love to be doing this in person, but we can't. So it's always nice to see everyone's face and, and, and big, big smile and um, do a bit of a wave. And, uh, you know, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of, uh, of Data and Digital Week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All I'll right. stay on to close the room, but uh, thank Bye. you. Bye. Have a great week. Thank Thanks, you. George. Bye, everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. there. Thank you. You you can you can go. Thank you. Great work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Looking forward to more conversations with you. Okay, my friend. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.